Okay, so last time on tour, we sort of did CT1, we did CT2. Uh, now we'll look at three and we'll look at four. Uh, so this will go sort of relatively quickly. Uh, just as a reminder, maybe I'll put these in the notes again. These are our eight guidelines. Okay, so core task three is where we left off. Uh, we did tease the issue, I sort of raised it, and we kind of half resolved it, but we didn't uh, really write it up. So core task three is we want to confirm that Tor is actually working, that the, the traffic is anonymous. Okay, so confirm. Okay, so here's Tor. This is what we see uh, when we look at it. Um, so my question to you last class is, okay, is, is Tor working or not? Okay, so, so I configured it. I walked through that configuration. I land on this page. This, I guess, is probably a local page, but if, if I type something in here, Did that actually go over Tor or not? Okay. Uh, so it's reasonable that it is, but how do you know? So you're a user, you're really concerned. I mean, if you, you might go to jail because you're a dissident in some country, and if this didn't go over Tor, right? And so you want that confirmation, right? You want to be really, really sure uh, that this actually went through Tor. You can't literally see the packet, so you're going to rely on the user interface to tell you. So you don't always like know for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, but at least is this user interface telling me that this went over Tor? Okay, so so the which? Uh, this side? Left side. The small onion? Is that what we like? Okay, okay. Yeah, so there is this onion uh, logo here, and this is actually the key to knowing whether it's enabled or not. Um, so just looking at that onion, before we click on it, I'm just going to stare at it. Uh, let me do a better screenshot than that. Is it on or off? So the, the onion is the key. Does that mean it, it's working or not working? Okay, okay. So this is a queue that's not really that good. So G7 is the one that sort of tries to talk about users, uh, the interface itself. You might put it under G8 as well, because the consequence of this is uh, that you don't know the application status. Okay, you're not really comfortable with the interface, you're not sure. To me, like something that's sort of gray and monotone kind of means it's off. You know, sometimes it's gray when it's off, and then when it's on, it's like colored. Yeah, like green or something like that um, means that it's on. So this is sort of a, a mental model that's consistent with a lot of user interfaces. So to me, looking at this, I'm thinking maybe it's off. I don't know. Um, so then what I can do is I can click on it. Okay. So if I click on it, this is what I see. So this is on a click. Okay, so I see new identity. I see some settings. I see check for browser update. So these things definitely don't tell me whether it's on or off, right? Okay, so this doesn't, to me, it doesn't confirm either way. This I'm not sure about, right? This implies that I have an identity right now. Like if I want a new one, then I have an existing identity. But isn't Tor about not having identities? It's about anonymity, right? So I have an existing identity. So this, maybe you're leaning towards it's like kind of off or something like that, okay? 
The third thing that you can do, which you wouldn't know unless if you stumble on it, and we did stumble on it, is you could hover your mouse over top of it. And if you hover your mouse, then you actually get what we're looking for, which is the most explicit confirmation, okay? So we're looking for this to say that, you know, Tor is absolutely on, it's enabled, that kind of thing. So you only see it on a hover of the mouse. Um, and so the answer to the overall question is yes, Tor actually is on, okay? So Tor is on. So if you hover uh, mouse over, uh, you see that it's on, okay? Uh, it's important that this is sort of the functionality. It would be really nice if you click on it and it also confirmed it. Uh, if the queue, you know, did, it could do more to like try and give you that vision as well. Uh, another thing that probably doesn't affect anyone in this room uh, is that um, there's a lot of people that have various disabilities, right? So uh, one common one would be some sort of visual disability. So you might be blind, for example. And so browsers are, uh, configured out of the box, and you probably wouldn't know this, but most browsers are have accessibility options that come with them. So this is a, a fork of Firefox, so it will have some uh, accessibility things, including a screen reader. So a screen reader turns any image that's on the screen into text, okay? And the way it does it is with the same thing that you get when you hover a mouse over, it tends to be that as well, okay? So if you're visually impaired, this actually might be clearer to you. It might be more obvious to you uh, that Tor is enabled because you would hear uh, audio confirmation that it's actually enabled. Um, but in terms of uh, sighted users, uh, it's not, it's actually not as clear uh, that it's turned on, okay? Uh, there's a bunch of other kind of junk over here. Uh, so we're not sure what this is. So there's another extension called NoScript. So it kind of turns JavaScript off uh, for, for sites and then you can whitelist them explicitly. Turns out that that's really important. I won't go into the details, but if you run arbitrary JavaScript, JavaScript can just ask what your IP address is and send it back. When JavaScript asks what IP address it is, JavaScript is locally running in your browser. Okay, so your IP address is your IP address. It's not your Tor IP address, it's your actual IP address. Um, so you wanna uh, be careful running JavaScript if you wanna maintain uh, anonymity. And then they have another plugin from EFF. So EFF also uh, sort of support Tor, they kind of uh, run Tor. And uh, this plugin will enforce sites that it knows about that have SSL connections that you only connect to them over SSL, you don't connect to them over HTTP. This stuff here? Oh, down by the search bar? This duck thing? Yeah, okay, so this is just the logo of the website itself. So uh, DuckDuckGo is a website that's kind of like Google, uh, but they don't do any cookies and tracing and things like that. Yeah. So it's something when you have Ghost reinstalled, you can try going to DuckDuckGo and see what does it look like compared to what does it look like when you go to Google, for example. And, and then you'll get a sense of, of what Ghost is actually doing for you. Um, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, then you have a standard SSL. Here they actually have a little, uh, they make it clear that there is some information. Uh, and when you click on this, notice that here it actually gives you some Tor information. So even though SSL and Tor have nothing to do with each other, this is actually showing you the Tor information itself, okay? Uh, if we go to a non-HTTP site, I don't know, I guess that probably pops up. Uh, just try and find one. It's great that the world we live in has so much HTTPS now. Um, so DuckDuckGo may also only, oh no. So of all websites not to support HTTPS, the actual store itself doesn't. Um, so this just comes over standard HTTP. And um, so when you click on this, they, they sort of shove the Tor information in with the SSL information as well. So that's maybe not the best location for it because I'm usually expecting that I would just see SSL information. But anyway, this is another user dialogue that would help you uh, establish whether CT3, whether Tor is, is um, enabled or not. Okay, and then you can see there are some core tasks beyond 
the four that I outlaid. Like for example, you might want to grant permissions to sites and things like this. So these uh, these are new. They're sort of new core tasks that uh, a user may or may want not want to do uh, beyond the four. So the four are just like a four basic set of core tasks. Okay. Uh, and so in this case, uh, it's kind of nice. So it shows you uh, I'm connected to a node in Germany. Then my traffic bounces back to the Netherlands. Then it bounces to Germany. Then it actually goes to where I'm going. Uh, the IP address that Montreal Impact Store will see is not my IP address. It's going to be the IP address of the exit node. Okay, so this is the exit node. Uh, this is the entrance node. Um, this whole dialogue doesn't make sense if you don't know what Tor does. So we know because we drew out the diagram. If I just told you, hey, go install this Tor thing, it's going to make you anonymous on the web. Uh, you don't know what circuit is. You don't know why there's a bunch of countries. You probably don't even know that it's a network thing. You just know like it's somehow anonymizing you and that kind of thing. So this in itself is not really sufficient for a novice user to establish that Tor is enabled uh, because it's referring to this mental model of Tor as a network and a novice user doesn't have that mental mo model. So for a novice user, they really want to see Tor enabled. Uh, that's, that's what they're looking for, this itself. And notice it doesn't say that's enabled per se. We're inferring that because we have the right mental model of how this works, okay? Uh, so for a novel, novice, sorry, user, uh, this sort of doesn't help. Uh, but it helps for an expert user. Okay. Uh, there's something else. Uh, so you, at any time, you can kind of refresh your identity so you can ask for a new circuit. Uh, in this case, I guess it's scoped just to this site. So that might be another core task. You could be like, okay, you're browsing with Tor, and now you want to change your circuit. So you want to change the IP address that the website sees as your exit node. Uh, that could be another core task, and you could analyze it. It's not part of CT3, so I'm not going to comment on it directly here, uh, but it's something else you could do. And I imagine that this new identity button does exactly the same thing as this blue button. So there's two different ways of accomplishing that particular core task. Um, so this could be another new kind of core task. Uh, another thing that happens with Tor is this, okay? So this is what this website looks like. Uh, let's say that we loaded it not over Tor, so let's just load it in Safari. So this is what the website actually looks like, okay? And so in Tor, it looks like this. So not quite as nice looking. What happened here? What happened? Okay, okay. So what happened is uh, it's actually no script. So it's not Tor's fault itself, but it's the no script browser's fault, uh, which is it's blocking all the JavaScript. So you can see that I think the, the core issue here is that none of this is loading over HTTPS. So it really doesn't like this site. Uh, and then in addition, it's this site is going to use a ton of... Um, of uh, JavaScript to render this page, maybe CSS and, and those kinds of things as well, okay? Um, so no script is sort of preventing this, okay? So this is another thing that you would look at in the course of a usability study. It doesn't really fit any of the core tasks, but a core task could also be, does the web continue functioning? You know, sort of <coughs> once it's turned on, can you browse the web as you're used to, okay? And so in this case, you, you cannot uh, do it, okay? Um, so no script, I'll just add it as a kind of note. We'll mangle some existing sites. That rely on JavaScript, CSS, that kind of thing. OK, and then you could also study, well, let's say I want to make this site look right. I'm willing to accept the risk of it, then could I disable uh, JavaScript and sort of refresh it with, a, with JavaScript uh, or with NoScript turned off? Um, and so it turns out that, that Java, 
NoScript gives you those options, but now you're kind of doing a usability study of, of NoScript uh, as opposed to doing a usability study of, of Tor per se. Uh, but you are kind of getting both of them at the same time. So I haven't used NoScript myself that I can't even, uh, I don't, I'm not even sure how to turn this off. I think this might be the button that works. Anyways, uh, there, there would be a way to disable this uh, completely and then you could actually load the page the way it looks like, okay? Do our users going to understand that that could compromise their anonymity? No. Okay, so the dialogue's not going to really help them with it. Um, but is that really Tor's fault? I don't know. I mean, they can't educate users on the entire dangers of using JavaScript and things like that. Uh, if you read that big document, I don't know if you recall, but when we installed it, there was all this fine print. Uh, it went into some details about like the dangers of running scripts and, and other things that might leak uh, your anonymity. Okay. Um, but anyways, there is the danger here that uh, because it mangles some sites, uh, users might disable no script. And then this might in turn break their anonymity. Once you break the anonymity, you can't get back. Okay, so you're done. Uh, so this is a dangerous error. It's not a recoverable error, so it's a dangerous error. Uh, which is G5 as opposed to G4. Uh, another thing uh, that's sort of related, once again, if you read the fine print of that document, you would understand it. Um, so let's say that I'm a novice user. So someone tells me, hey, go install Tor. You can browse the internet anonymously. So that's great. Uh, so I go here and you know I, I install Tor and I get it working and everything's great. And so I hover my mouse here, I see that Tor's enabled. Okay, so now I'm anonymous. Then I go and I open my email client, mail, right? Uh, so Tor's running, it's enabled, so that email is anonymized too, right? Mm. You're using email client, not, not a browser. Yeah, let's say that I'm not used, logging to Gmail through this, I'm just, say I use the mail application on Apple or Outlook Express or something like that. So I open up another application. Okay, so so what you're telling me is when I install Tor, well, what are you telling me? Like it doesn't anonymize my traffic? Okay, so I install this browser and everything in the browser is anonymized, but everything outside of the browser. So even though Tor is enabled on my computer, it's not actually enabled on my computer, it's more enabled just for this application. So that's right. So that's absolutely the right, correct mental model. Would that throw some users off? Would all users uh, understand that? Is that going to be obvious to all of them? I don't think so, right? So I think there are users who would see that Tor is enabled. They kind of went through the right steps, and then they would think that they're anonymous for all their applications. Um, so that's another uh, consideration. If Tor itself is applicable, or uh, what do you mean by that? Like, uh, we can only like, Tor can anonymize us only uh, like in the public web not I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of yes and no. So, so there is some debate. So obviously, if you go to Gmail and you log in, Google knows who you are, yeah. right? Uh, that said, you might have like a kind of anonymous Gmail account that you never associate with your real identity. And then by using Tor, you also don't associate it with your IP address. Right, and then other times you might you might not care that you know uh, that Google knows who you are, but you might still want to hide where you are or something like that. So you might still use Tor to obfuscate your IP. Then they they know it's you, but they don't know that you're here at Concordia as opposed to at home, as opposed to like somewhere else in the world. 
Um, so that could be another reason. So there, there are some uh, sort of, you know, not in the majority of use cases, but there are maybe a few side use cases where you would actually still use Tor even if you were logging into, into some service. But in general, yes, once you, uh, and Tor, that's another good point too is, um, so this is also in the fine print. Tor doesn't protect you from revealing your own identity, right? So if you fill out that web form and you leave your real email address, right? Tor can't scrub that out for you. Okay, so it's really, it's only protecting your IP address uh, at the end of the day. Um, so Tor doesn't stop you from revealing your own uh, identity. Okay, and so these are all in sort of the mental model of Tor, right? So if you say something as simple as it anonymizes you, that's not complicated enough as a mental model. You have to sort of, um, you have to impart the user with the right mental model so that they understand uh, the limitations of Tor in addition to what it actually does for you. Uh, so the final step is I'm using Tor. I don't like it. It's too slow. It's mangling websites. I want to turn it off. How do I turn it off? Um, I'll note too that also in, in the paper that we wrote like a really long time ago, there was no Tor browser. So Tor you actually configured either at the operating system level or you configured your browser uh, to run through it. And so it would actually, it could be configured to anonymize other apps as well. Uh, so the Tor browser is the easiest sort of most user friendly installation of Tor. You can install it at different levels. So if you want to uh, make other applications anonymous, like your mail application, uh, then you, you install Tor as a, a sort of operating system level program, and then you have to go into your mail client and point it at Tor, which is running locally. And uh, it, there's a lot of like kind of complexities with it, like the, the proxies that it speaks are different uh, than, than uh, the, the types of connections that are outbound. And there's, there's a bunch of like fine print with it. It doesn't always anonymize things. Um, Another side issue that, that that just reminded me of, uh, what about DNS? So let's say that uh, Tor is going to hide me, you know, I'm going to some, I don't know, political website and I don't want my government to know what it is. Okay, so when I'm using Tor, that's great. Uh, the government, if they're local to me, they just see that I'm submitting stuff uh, over Tor. Uh, but, and then the website itself, if let's say they seize the servers of that website, they see all the exit node IP addresses, they never see my real IP address, okay? But before I can go to that website, I have to get the IP address of where I'm going, okay? So what that means is I'm going to talk to my DNS server and I'm going to reveal to that DNS server that not necessarily what exact page I'm going to on this web domain, but I am revealing the fact that I want to go to this web domain, okay? Does DNS go through the browser? So if I'm using Tor browser, does that mean my DNS is going through the browser or not? Like here's the sort of mental model. So Alice is sitting here. Uh, she has her operating system. And so her operating system has like sort of direct connections to the internet for all apps. So basically you can think of it as like all apps here. Uh, and they have a kind of direct connection. And then for the one special app, which is the Tor browser, Then we go over the Tor network. And then we go to the internet. Okay, so it's sort of like, uh, here's all the apps. Yeah, and then the Tor browser is, is going to go uh, in the special thing. So is DNS here? Or is DNS here? And if DNS is here, that's a big problem uh, because uh, if the government's sitting on this line, then they're going to see, before I ever like go to that website, they're going to see that I'm interested in going to that website. Okay, so Tor makes no sense if DNS is here. Okay, so DNS does, it has to be here, otherwise it, it's really, really kind of pointless to use Tor, okay? Uh, and so that was another thing that was hard to configure. So if you're doing all this manually and manually configuring it, relatively easy to get your uh, browser running over Tor, but then to get DNS running across as well, you had to like 
you had to do a kind of deeper level integration in order to hook DNS as well. So luckily the Tor browser will take care of this for you, okay? Uh, and so they'll, um, they'll ensure uh, that DNS uh, does go over the Tor network as well. Um, anyways, okay, so that's another thing. And so this is fine for usability. Do you have to expose the user to all this? No, you just have to tell them that, that it's fine. Don't worry about it. And then just make sure that it actually is fine. Okay, uh, core task four is, is um, disable it. So how do I disable Tor? Can I, can I turn Tor off? So Tor is enabled. Can I turn it off? No, I can't. So the way the mental model for this is actually pretty sensible, which is if you're using this browser, Tor is on and it's always on. And if it's not on, the browser is not going to show you anything. Okay. So for some reason, if I can go and snip my Tor connection, the web, the serve browser will stop functioning. Okay. Uh, so as long as I'm in the browser, Tor is on. If I'm in a uh, different application than Tor's off. If I want to turn Tor off, I just close Tor browser and open Safari and switch. Okay, so that's the mental model. I think it's, it's fairly reasonable. Um, so in this case, you uh, close the application. Okay, uh, before it was sort of like uh, you would have a bunch of proxy settings, you would use those to, to connect to Tor, and then if you want to turn it off, you have to go and edit all your proxy settings again. It was kind of a nightmare to turn it off. But anyways, now with the standalone browser, it's a much cleaner um, user model, which is just that, yeah, if you're using the Tor browser, then you're anonymized, and if you're not using it, then you're not. Okay, so that sort of concludes what I want to say about Tor in terms of cognitive walkthrough, are there questions? So the detail here obviously isn't, um, think of it this way. So what we did in class, I'm sort of doing off the top of my head. Uh, so it's like the least amount of detail, the least verbose. Your assignment should be a little more verbose than what we did in class. And then the paper is like the most verbose, right? So your assignment should somehow be between this level of detail and the paper level of detail, which is super highly detailed. Okay, questions about this? You all have to do it. So uh, if, if you have questions, now's the, now's the time to ask them. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, so we're going to switch gears again. We're going to talk about a totally different thing. Not completely different. So there's a sort of theme between... Um, these three sections. So we started with social engineering. So that sort of brought humans into the equation in terms of security. Usability is obviously very human focused. Uh, now we're going to talk about procedures and policies. And these can have a kind of human focus. They tend to involve humans. Uh, they can also be fully automated. Uh, so I'll give you two examples. So one example uh, of a policy or procedure that's kind of human focused is, uh, we'll actually talk about airport security. I think it's interesting something that we're all, most of us anyways, are, are familiar with. And um, the second we'll talk about is a, a fully automated procedure, but the decisions that you make are very similar. So the fact that it's executed by a machine doesn't really make a difference whether it's humans executing it or machines. You have to understand what the policy is. You have to get it right. You have to make sure there's no corner cases that get it wrong. You have to make sure that there's no uh, what you might call escalation of privilege. So there's some other way of walking through the procedure that gets you something that you shouldn't uh, be able to get. Okay. Uh, so the first example will be airport security. Uh, and then the second, the sort of more boring technical one will be something called the same origin policy. And so this is in browsers. It concerns things like cookies, scripts, that kind of stuff. You'll see, you'll see it in a second. 
Okay, uh, so let's start with the first example, so airport security. Okay, so airport security is a really nice example of a kind of security procedure or policy or really a set of policies that are in play. Okay, so going and flying somewhere from a security perspective is, is a lot more complicated than you just buy your ticket and you show up. Okay, you know that you go through security. We actually literally call it security. Uh, and so there's actually a bunch of stuff that's sort of happening. Uh, and there's security goals that are trying to be met. Okay, so this whole procedure is sort of involved and there's a bunch of goals that people are trying to meet. So uh, some of the goals include uh, you shouldn't be able to fly with prohibited items, right? So that's the most obvious one. Uh, governments maintain a list of people who are not allowed to fly under any circumstance, okay? Called the no-fly list, okay? So this policy should enforce the fact that someone that's on the no-fly list is not allowed to fly. Uh, there's other things that are more logistical. So the airport doesn't want you to lose your flight or like miss your flight, okay? Uh, and so sometimes you're like showing your passport or your boarding pass just so they can sort of track you, so they can sort of see, oh, you did make it to the airport, you know, 90 minutes before your flight. Uh, and we can see that you're kind of stuck in the security line. Uh, and so then maybe we send someone over to pull you through or we hold the flight uh, in order to make sure that you're going through or something like that. Or we see that you, you came 10 minutes before your flight. Uh, the flight's about to leave. You're nowhere near. In fact, I can kind of see that you haven't even made it through security yet. That's your fault. Uh, so, you know, forget it. We're, we're going to leave anyways with it. Okay, so let's walk through step by step what actually happens. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting and complicated about it is there's a whole bunch of different entities that are involved. So usually you think of uh, security as you're kind of dealing with, or airport flying, you're sort of dealing with one kind of entity. It's sort of like you and the government or whatever. Okay, but it turns out that there's uh, different entities. So there's the airline, right? So they're a company. Uh, there is a government, but there's different divisions of the government, right? So not every government agent that you talk to is necessarily the same, right? Some of them work for uh, transport security. So like T CTTSA or, or TSA in the US. Some of them are border agents. So they have a different set of priorities than the, than the TSA agents. Uh, some of them might be law enforcement, like typical police, that kind of thing. They have a different set of procedures. Uh, there might be some checks with like the intelligence agency or something like that. Intelligence agency is not the same uh, as TSA and they're not the same as law enforcement and they're not the same as border services. Okay, so there's, there's a bunch of competing uh, different entities and that can become problematic because these entities don't always talk to each other. Or they don't always share information or uh, if one entity finds something that's relevant to the other, uh, there's, there's different things that are, are sort of involved. Okay, so airport security is a nice example of something that's kind of complicated. I'll even show you an attack on it, uh, an escalation of privilege attack that did work, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. It probably doesn't, it d absolutely does not work today in Canada and in the US, I think they, they closed the gap. But uh, looking at it and seeing it sort of illustrates why these things are kind of hard to get right uh, as well. Okay, and then it's also just sort of fun to talk about because uh, there's there's a lot of interesting things to say. Okay, so what I'm going to do is let's walk through the procedure. So most of you in this room probably have flown somewhere. Uh, most of you have probably gone on an international flight. And so we'll concentrate more on, on sort of the international case. Uh, and so where does the process start? What's the very first thing where there's some sort of con security consideration? Uh, during, uh, the, when we go to the airline counter and get the boarding pass. Okay, so you're going to show up at the airline counter, you're going to ask for your boarding pass, or you're going to talk to this terminal. That's certainly the first thing that you do uh, when you walk into the airport. Does that mean you haven't done anything before that point? Okay, so you have your passport. We'll assume that you're already a passport carrying person. Okay, so you already have your passport. We won't consider that in the whole scheme of things. So there, are, there might be some counter before it. I'm thinking of something before you even show up at the airport. Something all of you did? Okay, you have to have your ticket, right? You're not gonna show up and maybe you could show up and purchase it, then it would happen at the airport, but probably 99% of your cases, you uh, have already purchased your ticket, you're just walking in to get your boarding pass, okay? Uh, when you purchase your ticket, uh, that's actually where security kicks it. So it actually starts at that process. So before 
uh, before they even issue your ticket and you just ask to purchase a ticket, there's already some security checks uh, that are beginning to take place. Um, so step one is you purchase the ticket. So yeah, let's let's consider that. So that's the question. So I'll answer that in a second. Yeah. Okay. When you purchase a ticket, uh, well, who do you purchase it from? Uh, so there's different scenarios. Let's say that maybe I'm purchasing it from uh, like a middle person, like Expedia. Okay. Expedia is going to talk to the airline. So let's say I'm flying Air Canada. Okay. And uh, when I purchase a ticket, what do I have to say? So obviously I tell Expedia how much I wanna pay. They say, great, this is the price. I picked the time and all of that stuff. So I have my flight, okay? What else do I have to provide? Okay, so I have to present my identity, my name, okay? Can I book a ticket in someone else's name? Well, you could if you had all their information, but if you don't have their information, you can't. Uh, if I book a ticket for me and I decide I don't wanna fly anymore, uh, I wanna give my ticket to someone else, that's no problem, right? I just give them, no, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? Because it's not transferable to your identity. Okay, so the purchase of a ticket is tied to an identity. So that's the only person that could fly. It turns out that maybe if you could find someone with the exact same name, for some countries, they might be able to fly as well. Uh, but usually it's tied to uh, at least your name if not your passport ID, which is a unique identifier for you. So this could vary from country to country. Okay. Why does Expedia care about who you are? Like how about when you show up and you, you get your boarding pass, then you show some identity, so that's great. Uh, then you could actually transfer your tickets, right? It'd be more like a train or a bus. Even there, you don't even show identity anyways, right? Uh, so wouldn't that be better for you? I mean, you probably all booked tickets, or maybe you haven't all, but anyways, there might be some of you who have booked a ticket where you couldn't fly for some reason or something like that. And so being able to give that to someone else would be great, right? So why doesn't it work that way? So it's a policy, it's made up, no real reason. So it's not the case, but that we will see, okay? We will see like policies that are almost like completely arbitrary. Uh, Okay, so they're going to check your background. The only objection to I have what you said is you say they check it quick. They don't check it quick. Okay. Uh, and that's actually why you can't do it in real time. So if you showed up and showed your identity, they couldn't do it quick enough. Yeah. Number will purchase all the tickets in black. They say what? Purchase all the tickets in black. And black it? Oh, I see, I see. So they, they're, in this case, they're probably not buying the actual tickets themselves. They must be buying some entitlement to those tickets itself. But yeah, you do have to buy them in the name of the person itself. Yeah. How about doing it quick, though? Uh, so you're saying that you cannot go to the counter at the airport and say, I want a ticket flying now, and you only give it to me? So they will sort of, it's complicated. So you're going to have to wait. That's the main thing. So they won't issue it right away. So this is what happens behind the scenes. So you go to Expedia, Expedia goes to Air Canada, and Air Canada is going to check with the government. Uh, so in this case, it would be the Canadian government. I don't know who maintains the no-fly list. I assume it's CSIS, but it, it could be some other division uh, with the no-fly list, okay? Now, this, is, this happens as fast as Air Canada and the government can talk to each other, which is usually a database check, okay? So it's usually fairly quick. Uh, when there's a million tickets being it, bought on Expedia, there ends up being kind of a queue or a lineup. So what would happen is if you buy it in, in place, you would sort of skip the line. And so Air Canada would ask, but they do do that check. Yeah, so you might have to wait some amount of time. Um, if you book it on Expedia, this is why you get an email that's sort of like, we're confirming your ticket. And then like maybe an hour later, it doesn't take an infinite amount of time. Maybe it comes in 10 minutes or something like that. It's like, okay, now your ticket is like confirmed and issued kind of thing. So you always get a kind of two-step confirmation, okay? Uh, so what they ask is, are you on the no-fly list? And then you get back an answer, yes, no. And then uh, Expedia will actually issue the ticket or not 
issue the ticket, depending on whether the answer is yes or no. Okay, so this happens actually when you purchase a ticket. This is why your ticket is tied to your identity is because this no fly check happens there. It doesn't happen when you show up. Okay, so it's already, so if, the, if they say you're not on the no fly list, then you get your ticket. My understanding is if you're then added to the no fly list, right, uh, that, that you already have your ticket. Now they, they probably have a record of all the tickets so they can probably go back and retroactively uh, remove your ticket. And certainly when you show up with your passport at the airport, then they'll be pulling you into uh, secondary screening. But uh, anyway, so this is why the, the ticket takes some time to issue is because it's actually being checked from the airline to the government, whether you're on the no-fly list or not, okay? And it's important that it's the airline that's handling this for, for reasons that we'll describe later. Not important, it's, it, it, it's relevant that it's the airline that does this check, as opposed to TSA doing this check or uh, border services or someone like this, okay? So it's, it's the airline that's actually uh, doing this check. Um, yeah, okay, okay, so this is fine. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the government that they check with, there's, there's a couple of different parameters. So this airline will be based in some jurisdiction, usually, and it's usually tied to where you're flying out of, right? So um, there's up to four countries that can be involved. So there's uh, the country where the airline is headquartered. There's your destination and your origin. So those might be different countries. So you could fly Air Canada from the US, maybe, I don't know, maybe you can't. Um, I think if you fly Air Canada, it's probably your, either your destination or your origin is, is Air Canada. But certainly one of those could be another country. And then your passport can be issued by a third country as well. Yeah, uh, and so the extent of the check is they probably try and check all of them. So, uh, destination, origin, and passport, uh, not all countries will support it, right? So this is the norm for some nations like Canada. I'm not saying that every country does this exact check. Not every government in the world probably maintains a no-fly list. Uh, Canada certainly does. Uh, there's also some sharing of information from Canada and other jurisdictions like uh, the US, Britain. There's like what's called the five eyes, and so they share probably the same no-fly list and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's another thing. So I didn't in include that uh, in this process, but um, that could be something as well. So I guess before you purchase the ticket, or is it before you fly? Before you, okay. It might also vary. Um, as a Canadian, you know, I'm very privileged to actually have never apply for a visa. So I've no, I don't even know what that process looks like. Um, I, everyone's like really mad at me right now. It's like, my students can't fly anywhere without visa issues. And so I feel really bad for them, but um, you know, I, uh, yeah. But anyways, yeah, so we'll ignore the visa process as well, but that's another relevant step. And usually the visa is there to have you check uh, whether you're on the no-fly of the country that you're uh, trying to come into, right? So, uh, for example, the United States requires a visa for all sorts of, of countries around the world. Uh, and so that's definitely going to uh, ensure that you're checked against the no-fly list in case the airline isn't checking. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you purchase the ticket, it's tied to an identity, you can't sort of untie it or unstaple it. <clears throat> okay, so that's great. Now we're going to go to the airport. And the first step that we want when we show up at the airport is we want our boarding pass. Okay, we purchased our ticket, we have our passport, we want our boarding pass. Um, so we're going to obtain boarding pass. Uh, it turns out that we don't actually have to do this at the airport anymore. Okay, we could print it at home, we could have the iOS app that adds it to Apple Wallet, uh, whatever the case may be. Okay, so we can skip this and do from home. <clears throat> uh, 
And so if you show up and do it in person, you will have to kind of show your passport to the person. But if you do it at home, you don't have to show your passport to anyone. Okay, you might have to know a passport number or something like that, uh, but you don't have to show it. And uh, all it really confirms is that you know the passport number of someone. It doesn't confirm anything about who you actually are. Okay, it's not like someone's looking at your face and comparing it to your passport picture. Okay, uh, once again, also relevant for later when we when we think about uh, escalation of privilege on these things. Um, so do you show passport at this stage? Yes, if in person. So they will ask for it if you go up to the booth. Uh, no, uh, if you use a kiosk or do at home. OK, and show passport. But what I really mean by that is show passport and, and sort of have them match it to your face. OK, so at the kiosk, you might have to scan a passport. OK, but it's not necessarily going to confirm that it's your passport. Uh, it could be a passport that you found on the ground or something like that. OK, uh, so I'll say show passport and uh, confirm identity. I'll say confirm passport holder. Okay, so our sort of mental model of this is, this is another operation that you're doing with the airline. So this involves Air Canada, it doesn't involve anyone else. Uh, I sort of ask for it. Uh, they ask for some, some details, my last name, my passport number, my confirmation number, something like that. Uh, and then I'm issued uh, the boarding pass. The boarding pass itself, uh, there's some information on it, okay? Um, so there's, for example, it contains information like, say your seat number. Yeah, some sort of maybe ticket number. Uh, in some countries like the United States, uh, you might be able to go to the fast security line. Uh, so this is called TSA pre-check. Uh, so that would also be on your boarding pass. A lot of this information is encoded in some sort of barcode. Okay. Let's say that you decide, hey, I really, you know, I didn't get TSA pre-check, but, you know, I don't want to wait in line. Uh, I'm printing this thing at home. Why don't I just Photoshop TSA pre-check on top of my boarding pass? Is that good or not? Could, it, could you get away with that? So it turns out that as of at least, unless if they change anything in the last two years, yeah, absolutely. So none of this information is authenticated. Okay, so it's just a piece of paper. There is a barcode. That barcode could maybe sign all of the details on it, but it essentially isn't signed. Or if it is signed, no one's actually checking, like no one's going line by line and seeing that it actually matches the digital copy of what's on the barcode, okay? Sometimes people scan barcodes, but they don't look at it. They just kind of grab it, scan it, grab it, scan it. You know, it's sort of like green light, red light kind of thing. Uh, and so as of a couple years ago anyways, if you want to, if you want to go to the TSA pre-check line, that's fine. Just print it on your boarding pass and uh, off you go. Uh, so the, they'll look and to see that it's on your boarding pass and that's it. Okay, so it's not um, generally not authenticated. Yeah. So that's why it's probably not signed is because it's a mess, right? So uh, who would sign it? Well like the website that's issuing it to you, the kiosk might have to have the key in it. So like the whole key management, then how do they even recognize who the key is? Is it Air Canada that signs it? Is it TSA because TSA is doing the pre-checked? You know what I mean? So like the whole key management is, is actually probably the answer to your question, which is why is it not signed? Yeah. Um, so you'd have to figure out the whole, yeah, that whole key side thing. Um, okay, so that's great. So we have a boarding pass. Uh, if you're checking baggage, uh, now you're going to go drop it off. So you drop it on the conveyor belt and it disappears. Okay, uh, you don't know what happens to your bag. 
right? You, you leave it and then magically it shows up on the other end or it doesn't, right? Um, uh, and so, so that's fine. But there is a lot of sophisticated technology behind it. Uh, so there's a, a whole s bunch of sophisticated. To do two things. Uh, so the first thing is it's just going to track your bag to make sure it ends up in the same in the right place. So, you know, a ticket will be appended to it. There's cameras and I don't know if RFID readers, I don't know, like I think they're just, it's all visual information, but anyways, uh, they're able to sort of track it and make sure it goes uh, to the right place. Uh, and also to do some clearance on it. Meaning, do you have any illicit items in your uh, carry-on baggage, okay? And so, sorry, in your checked baggage. So the restricted items are different uh, than what you can carry on, right? So I'll talk a more a bit about illicit items when we get to that step of it. Um, but, you know, like say you have liquids that are over 100 ml. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're in your check baggage. It matters if they're in your carry-on baggage. Uh, if you have a gun or a bomb or something like that, uh, you can't put it in check baggage or in your uh, carry-on baggage. It's prohibited on both stages. Okay. Uh, same thing with, let's say, drugs, uh, for example. Uh, and so anyways, there's going to be some uh, things that happen behind the scenes to try and clear these baggages itself. So we don't know exactly what they all look like, but it's probably very similar to the types of things that is inspect your carry-on. So like x-ray machines, uh, dogs that sniff for drugs or bomb making material. Um, they can actually inspect it. Uh, so they can manually inspect it if it looks suspicious or they get a tip off or something like that or there's something about the whole schedule of your flight or something like that that, that makes them suspicious. Then they'll actually grab your bag, they'll open it up. Uh, if it's locked, uh, they'll break the lock on it. Um, so they, you're not allowed to break, uh, or you're, sorry, you're not allowed to lock your luggage or at least you, you risk them uh, basically unlocking it. Um, so then uh, what people said is, well, that's dumb. If TSA is just going to break my lock, what's the point of, of locking my luggage? So then they started selling these special TSA locks. And so there's two keys that unlock it. So one of them is the, the key that the TSA agent has, and then the other is your personal key. Okay. And so the idea is that uh, your friend can't unlock it, but the TSA can lock it, unlock it. Okay. Now, the problem with this whole protocol is the TSA key was actually only one key. So there was one kind of master key for every single TSA agent in the entire United States, okay? And all it takes is one person, one of those like probably hundreds of thousands or thousands at least of TSA agents to leak what that key is and put it on the internet and then you could 3D print out your own TSA key and it's going to unlock every single bag uh, that has one of these locks, okay? So that's what happened. So very quickly that master key got leaked uh, and so you can buy, if you want to go on eBay, you can buy yourself a TSA key and it will unlock all of these, these things. So that's actually a key management problem. It's a physical key management problem, but it's not that much different than a PKI problem. Uh, the final thing, uh, the reason that there's less scrutiny is that there is some sort of physical isolation of bags when they're on the plane from the passengers, of check bags from passengers. Okay, so if you want access to your checked bag, once you're in the air and you're flying, uh, you're not necessarily going to be able to do it. I don't know what that looks like if, it, if it's like a series of locks or if there's actually no like door, like it's literally a separate container. I'm not sure, it probably depends on the air, uh, the different models of the airplane and things like that. But there is at least some isolation uh, from the bags, uh, from the passengers themselves, okay? Uh, so this is relevant more like for a terrorist kind of threat where, I don't know, maybe you have some bombs or something like that that are in your check bags uh, and you want to have access to them, okay? So
so who are the people that look at your bags? So here's Alice. Uh, she drops her luggage off. It goes on that belt. Okay, eventually it ends up on the airline. Uh, so there's basically two people that are going to look at the baggages. Uh, so the first is the same people that do the screening uh, for you. So in Canada, they're called the CTTSA, just TSA in the USA. Uh, so they're the same people. Um, they're basically looking for, is there any safety consideration? Is there anything in your bag that might make having this bag on the airplane unsafe for the passengers? Okay, so that's their primary motivation. So uh, weapons, bombs, that kind of stuff is a TSA concern. Drugs, uh, money uh, over $10,000, those kinds of things are not a TSA concern. They don't care about that. It's not a safety concern with it, okay? But the government does care about it. It's just not the TSA that cares about it. Uh, so if you're flying over, for example, an international border, then it's going to be the border agents uh, that, that care about it. So in Canada, it's the court, Canadian Border Service. Okay, so they're looking at a different set of things. What are you bringing into this country, right? Uh, are you bringing illicit, you know, items? Uh, if you're, you're bringing a lot of cash, uh, there's all sorts of, of different things uh, that, that could come across, okay? Um, so these are two different agencies and there's sort of two different lineups for them. Uh, there's actually a really good show if you want to watch it. Uh, it's like kind of a reality show about Canadian border services where they, uh, what's it called? I forget the name of it, but. Okay, okay. Anyways, yeah, it's, uh, and so anyways, it's sort of a reality show. So they follow like two or three cases of, of things that go across. Uh, and, and it's interesting the kinds of things that they're looking at and like the ways that they verify things. And so um, there's different issues. Some of them are more like immigration issues, like why are you here? And they can like, they have a lot of power, right? Like they can basically seize everything. So if you go across and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not here to work. I'm just here to visit a friend but they think that you're here to work, then they'll be like, oh, you have a phone, give me your phone. It's locked, give me the password. Then they'll go into your email and then they'll see that, oh, like two weeks ago, you sent an email to this guy who was like setting up, you know, your work appointment. You told me that you weren't coming to work, but there's this email, I'm gonna call that person, right? And then they call them and they're like, hey, like uh, we were just wondering, like, are you hiring this person? And then they're like, yeah, yeah, we're hiring them or whatever. And then, you know, and then they send you back, like kind of thing. And so um, they, yeah, so anyways, they have like, they have, and there's a lot of criticism too of, of the amount of legal power that they have because they can kind of hold you indefinitely uh, and things like that as well. And so uh, when you go through border services, you're really sort of getting up a lot of, of your rights uh, as either a citizen or a non-citizen of the country that you're uh, going through. So anyways, it's, Interesting show. Okay. Um, okay, let's do one more and then we'll, we'll take the break. Um, so before you get to the big show, the big show is the metal detectors and all of that stuff. Uh, there is one person that you talk to. Okay, so who do you talk to after you've, you've dropped your bags off uh, and you're, you're not in the security line yet? Uh, who, who do you interact with? Okay, so not usually, so usually immigration might be after, or it might be actually when you land, uh, depending on it. Uh, us agents who scan for boarding pass. Okay, so when you get into the line for the very first time, before you actually get up to the metal detectors, there's always someone at the end of the line, okay? And they scan your boarding pass, okay? Uh, so we'll call that pre-screening. Do they check your passport? Okay, so people are saying yes and no, you're actually both right. It depends on the country. Uh, so in Canada, no, uh, so no passport check. In the US, they do check your passport. Uh, okay, why are they there? They don't check your passport. And you might not have actually talked to someone. So let's say you print off your boarding pass at home. You're not checking any baggage. You're just carrying on. 
This is actually literally the first person you talk to. Uh, because uh, by the time we book the ticket and by the time we reach to that point, there may be change in the both languages. Okay, so it could be something related to the no-fly list. I don't think so. Maybe maybe it's a case, but uh, at some point they would they would like notify you uh, of that. Yeah. Um, so you are denied access. Usually that happens at border services. Uh, that's that's usually when when that when there's some sort of uh, issue like that. Uh, so there are examples of people who have like kids uh, who are like two years old and they're on like the no-fly list, right? And in Canada, the no-fly list was like top secret. It was like a security agency. So there's no way you can like go on the internet to see if you're on it or not. It's all based on name. So what happened in this case is the kid's name happened to match someone's name who was on the list. So it clearly wasn't the two-year-old that was like the terrorist threat, right? Um, it was just someone that happened to have the same name and people thought it was absurd. And then there was, you didn't even know who to go to fix. Like, I want to fix this, but like, who do I talk to? Like, is it border services? Is it CSIS? Is it this kind of thing? So anyways, it happened enough now that in Canada, they've outlined some procedures. So there are ways to like, uh, sort of get yourself off the no-fly list and, and things like that. Uh, but I don't think that happens here. I could be mistaken. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's happening here is, is actually most of this is just logistical. It's not actually security. Um, so the primary purpose of this is logistical. Uh, so the first thing is to know that you're in line. Okay, so this is the first record that you're actually here in person. We know that you entered the line. Usually when you reach the end of the line, they might scan it again, or you'll give it to the agent uh, at the actual security gate to scan it again. Okay, so they can sort of see where you are in the system. Maybe on aggregates, they could see what's the average time it's taking people to go from the start of the line to actually through security so they can figure out what the waiting time is and things like that. Um, so it's, it's meant to track you. Um, in the airport and to sort of timestamp your arrival, uh, direct you to the right gate. So, so maybe you, you line up at the wrong line, uh, then they're going to catch that as well. Uh, so they might redirect you. Okay. But there is a little bit of security that happens, at least in some countries, okay? So some of these people are actually trained security agents. And what they're looking for is, they're trying to, to determine if you have any suspicious behaviors, okay? Um, so in the US, uh, this, they used uh, people here. Uh, and even before you show up to the line, you're on cameras and things like that. So you're, you're basically being surveilled. Uh, the the whole time, uh, but this is where they would implement something called the spot program, uh, which I'll just say upfront is is very controversial, and I'll, I'll show you why. Uh, and uh, basically, they're they're checking for suspicious behaviors. Uh, so the spot program was uh, something that people thought uh, was happening, but they didn't really know uh, whether or not it was happening. And then someone who worked for the TSA leaked uh, the sort of basic outline of the program. Uh, so they confirmed, A, the program is happening, and they actually leaked the document that, that tells what are the metrics that they're looking at, what are the behaviors that they're looking for that they consider uh, suspicious, and it turns out that it has a very like kind of structured test. So it's kind of like a, a grading system. So if you exhibit certain behaviors, you get a certain number of points. And if you get enough points, then uh, they bring the police in or there's a bunch of different outcomes. OK, uh, it was controversial uh, because the behaviors were um, things that people thought maybe wouldn't be suspicious. Um, and uh, there wasn't a lot of data on how successful it was, but it seemed like this program was really unsuccessful. Uh, a lot of people said it was just like hokey science. Uh, there was no science that backs it up. And it didn't actually catch like anything, anyone of significance. Uh, and so anyways, what we'll do is we'll go away, take 10 minutes uh, for the break. And then when we come back, I'll show you the actual document and, and we'll walk through it. And so you can see it for yourself. All right, so I'll show you the details of the SPOT program. 
as leaked by someone to uh, the press. All right, so the SPOT program, there's a lot of detail here, so I won't go through all of it. Um, but it's kind of like, like I say, it's sort of a scoring system. And so uh, what they do is they look for certain factors and then the, you might get one point if you exhibit any of these. You might get two points. I know you can't read it, I'll zoom in in a second. Three points uh, if, if you exhibit any of these. Um, and then there's some, some other types of things. Uh, in terms of notation, they, they refer to LEO, uh, that stands for Law Enforcement Officer. Uh, so the police, essentially. Okay, uh, so whoops. So this is a good lesson in what to or not do uh, at an airport. So if you like secondary screening, uh, here's a bunch of, of things that you can do. Sorry, this scrolling um, gesture is backing me up. OK, so these are worth one point each. Uh, so just in terms of how many points you need before you get into trouble. Um, so 0 to 3 is normal. Uh, if you have 4 to 5 of these points, then you're going to get uh, sent to secondary screening. OK, so you're going to have more attention. Uh, and if you score 6 or more, uh, then they're going to tell the police about you. OK? Um, so what are the, you can think in your head, what are the kinds of things that you would do? And then you can cross check it. Sorry, I'm having a lot of trouble with this. I should probably uh, just open it in Safari, or sorry, in preview. Just give me one sec. Okay. Okay, it's not the greatest resolution, but I think you can say it. Okay, so one point. So if you arrive late for your flight, don't do that. Always make eye contact uh, with the person. Uh, if you don't make eye contact, then they're going to deduct a point. Uh, be careful about how you yawn. Uh, so excessive yawning, uh, for example. Uh, if you're fidgeting, looking at your watch, that kind of thing. Uh, if you're sweating a lot. Uh, well, it depends. So if you're, you know, if you're in the Caribbean and it's really hot and it's an outdoor airport, then you're okay to sweat. Uh, but if you're in Montreal and it's winter, uh, then you shouldn't be sweating. Uh, if it looks like you had a beard at one point, but now you've shaved it off right before you fly, uh, that might be an indication of I don't know what. Um, some of these, I'll note, one of the biggest criticism is that it's sort of borderline racist, uh, some of them, and it's also based on pseudoscience. So that's the two main criticisms of it. And then I'll show you exactly who got caught by this. But anyways, uh, facial flushing, uh, if you blink too fast, uh, if you're Adam Apple jump, so like in men more than women, uh, you have this in your throat. Uh, if I can see your arteries beating in your neck, uh, strong body odor, so wear deodorant, uh, sweaty palms, that kind of thing. Now you have to get six of these, okay? But let's say you're late for your flight, right? You're already at one point. You're probably sweating because you ran there, so that's another point. You might smell because you're sweating. So you're already at like three of your six points. Um, uh, oh yeah, another one, my favorite, whistling as the individual approaches the screening process. Uh, so if you look nervous, that's bad. But if you look too casual, like you're faking it, then that's bad. So you have to be like really normal, like chill, like sort of in the middle uh, kind of thing. Um, so these are things that, that give you two points. Um, so if your bag doesn't really match what they think your bag should look like, uh, if you have bulges in clothing, so some of these things are, are fine. If you have a cold, penetrating stare, uh, so be careful with that. Uh, if you are sort of like always rubbing your hair, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, if your posture is too rigid, uh, then that matters. Um, lots of things about your eyes. Uh, these are the bad ones, so three points. Um, so if you're confused or disoriented, you get three points automatically. If you appear to be in disguise, that will get you three points. If you start asking the agent about security related things like, oh, where are the security cameras? Or like, I don't know. I always have this conversation because I'm interested, but now I stop doing that. No, I'm just kidding. But um, if they tell you to do stuff and you don't go to this line and then you're just like, no, I'm going to go to this line instead, uh, that will get you three points. 
uh, if it looks like you're there's other accomplices and you're like passing stuff to them and things like that, uh, giving hand signals, uh, that kind of thing will get you three points. Uh, if you're sort of walking through like kind of feeling yourself, uh, then uh, that also uh, will land you three points. Okay, then there's ways to lose points. So you can be really, really nervous, but uh, if you're th your family's with you, then you get two extra sort of bonus points. If you're married, so you should travel with someone else, uh, then that's two. Uh, only if you're old though, so if you're 55 years old or more, uh, then that deducts two points, uh, similarly with, with old age, okay? Uh, so anyway, so uh, if you get three of these, you're fine. If you get four, then you're going to selective screening. If you get six, uh, you're going straight to law enforcement. Do not pass go. Um, there's some other stuff here too, uh, other point systems. So these are some things that would be weird. If we look at your bag uh, and then we see that you have like GPS units, scuba gear, blueprints, uh, almanacs, uh, standard stuff that you know about, uh, a lot of like photographs of like high, like if you have nuclear plant, like blueprints and like photographs, like aerial map photographs and things like that. And then a bunch of wires, loose wires and batteries. Uh, that's going to get you in trouble. Um, there's a bunch of different signs of, of uh, deception. Um, so we talked a little bit about this in social engineering. Uh, so trying to gauge sort of uh, behavioral metrics is sort of, there is some science to back it up, but this tends to be like really kind of loose. And uh, it's also really hard for like someone, even if they undergo a bit of training, uh, to, to detect these and to detect what the difference is uh, for example, if you change your voice pitch, like I often do that in class just because, you know, I talk all day. Uh, and so like why, what the actual root cause of these things are, okay? Um, these are the, the really bad things. Uh, and so these automatically refer you to law enforcement. Um, so uh, yeah, if you're disorderly interfering with screening, uh, if you have some indicative behavior, so they don't say what these are of a suicide bomber, uh, then they'll, they'll do it. Uh, if you have two or more of the previous deceptions, uh, as soon as you have some sort of firearm, dangerous weapon, some sort of prohibited weapon, uh, if you have a lot of money, uh, so standardly that's over $10,000 for most countries. Um, uh, even if you have a large sum of money, but it's under $10,000, then that could expose you at least to secondary screening. Uh, so it looks like you have, maybe you have $9,000. Uh, then you are trying to move money out of the country. You're trying to stay within that 10,000 limit. Uh, it looks like money laundering or, or transport of, of monies. It will expose you to secondary screening. It's not illegal. You can travel with $9,000, uh, but, but they're going to want to know where that money's coming from. Are you carrying it for someone else? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, anyways, you can uh, see uh, some of the other stuff as well. Um, so, okay, so the idea was that uh, um, basically it was sort of that person who would scan your border uh, pass, boarding pass, that would actually sort of do this. They wouldn't actually write it down per se, but they would sort of keep track in their head of how many points that you exhibited. Uh, or there might be other agents too that are either watching you on camera or maybe they're not the ones scanning your, your boarding pass, but they're sort of observing from that position. But anyway, this is all happening sort of before you enter the security line. And then some of them are when you're actually in the security line and they, they look through your bag and they found a bunch of stuff. Okay, uh, so this is the SPOT program. Uh, how successful was it? Um, so of all the people that went through it, 4% uh, were actually referred to law enforcement. So 4% uh, uh, sort of exhibited enough points uh, that they were um, referred. And 4% is actually a pretty big number. It might not seem like a big number, but uh, think about this room, there's maybe 100 people here, so that's four of you, right? So that's a lot like to, to you know, think of how fast airports are and the number of people that go through, like it's high volume. There's easily 100 people in line at any given time. Four out of 100 is actually, um, is, is quite a bit of, of thing. And they're going to the police, right? They're going to law enforcement. It's not even going to secondary uh, screening. Uh, so that leaves something like 96% left. And then the numbers are actually really nice and clean uh, because of the 4% that refer to law agent, an additional 4% of this 4%. Um, so 
96% of them here were false positives. Uh, so basically, they, there wasn't anything. Okay. Uh, and then for 4%, there was an actual problem. Okay. Uh, what was the problem? Okay, so the first problem is that they might have been uh, a terrorist or had some signs that, that would indicate that they were uh, terrorists. So of the 4% of the 4%, uh, how many terrorists did they catch with this program? Um, so it's a nice round number, 0%. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, a bunch of people who were sort of undocumented, meaning that they didn't have the right visa, they didn't have the right passport, they were traveling under a false passport, that kind of thing. And so that was basically the bulk majority of them. Uh, so it's like something like 90%. And then the other 10% were just sort of miscellaneous issues. Maybe they were drunk, intoxicated, or uh, something like that. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so it could have been carrying illicit uh, drugs and that type of thing as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's, that was sort of 10%. Okay, uh, so the, the program, because it's implemented by TSA, TSA is actually really concerned with the safety of airlines. Okay, that's their, their primary motive. Undocumented workers, or not just workers, just travelers in general, that is something the government cares about, but it's not TSA's job. That's actually border services job, okay? And so basically this was sort of doing border services jobs for them, but it was being sponsored by the TSA program. And so it was actually a big, like, not success. It was a big bust uh, in terms of, of how successful it was at uh, trying to, to achieve what the TSA actually wanted, okay? Um, so uh, anyways, it was... It was unsuccessful for the TSA anyways. Um, uh, it was heavily criticized in terms of the actual criteria that they used. And I'm not sure if it's still implemented. I think that they said they were sort of ambivalent about whether they were going to remove this program or not. So uh, we don't, I don't think we still know whether it's still in effect. Anyways, now you know how to act uh, when you line up. Uh, you know the things not to do. OK, now the main show. So the main show of airport, quote unquote, security is the security screening. OK. Uh, so this is a protocol, little mini protocol procedure that involves you and in Canada, the CTTSA. Okay, it's not border service, it's not the border agents, it's not law enforcement directly, it's the CTTSA. Uh, basically what you're going to do is you're going to show them uh, your boarding pass. Uh, your passport you do not show, okay, at this stage. Uh, you just generally show your boarding pass only. Uh, and then obviously whatever you're carrying on your person. So whatever items you have in your possession at that time. Items. Okay, uh, so basically what happens is there's some sort of search, I'll just call it a search, uh, of you and your items. And the search looks different depending on whether it's you or your items. So some of them are, are sort of in common and some of them are, are specific. Uh, so for you, the most common search would be a metal detector. Uh, there could be a full body scan. So this is the sort of x-ray uh, machine that takes an image of you. It can see through your clothing. 
uh, privacy considerations. It was very controversial when it was introduced because someone would see basically, even though your face is sort of blurred out like a nude shot of you. Uh, and then there was concern about whether the person who's looking at this sort of nude version of you is also looking at you, the person, or are they off in a different room? And so there was all these policies that most countries implemented where the person looking at the uh, machine or uh, the screen is not physically present, so they're like in a different room and things like that. But still, there's a lot of people that didn't like these. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't agree to have a full body scan and you can opt out of it if you want. Okay, so you can say no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Uh, if you do that, uh, then you will uh, get a full body pat down instead. Uh, so if you opt out, you'll get a pat down. Uh, so this means an agent is going to search you by basically touching you all over your body uh, to see uh, what you have on your person. Um, Okay, some other things that they might subject you to. Uh, these are usually either at random or part of secondary screening or because you've targeted and they, they're telling you it's at random, but really they're, they've targeted you for, for whatever reason. Um, so there could be like some sort of chemical swab. So you might have to show your hands and then they'll like kind of rub a little tissue against your hands and then they'll put it in a machine. Uh, they're looking for like chemicals that are involved in bomb making usually. Uh, and there might be animals that are deployed as well. So like dogs, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, your items are probably going to go through an x-ray. And then there might be an additional search as well where they ask you to open your bag. They ask you to turn your laptop on, that kind of thing. Okay, so this is the procedure. So this is the how, what's the why? What are they looking for? Why, why are you being subjected to all of these things? So we have some indication here of, of maybe what the why is. Essentially at the end of the day, sort of in an umbrella sense, they're looking for prohibited items, okay? So there's certain items that you're not allowed to fly with and that's what this screening is set up for. All right, so what are prohibited items? What are you not allowed to search with, fly with? Uh, lithium batteries. Okay, so I heard knives, uh, so weapons of any sort, explosives, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, liquids. Uh, what does that mean? Water? You can't, yeah, so water, any kind of liquid. You can't fly with any liquids at all? Okay, so generally there's a limit on it. Uh, so yeah, you might buy it, but then it might be given to you after and things like that. But anyway, basically the limit is that you get 100 ml per bottle, but then you can have multiple bottles, but they all have to fit uh, in some sort of Ziploc bag. I forget the size of the Ziploc, but there's a specific size. Okay, so this is meant to put a limit on uh, the amount of liquid that you can fly with. Why are they concerned with whether you have a two liter bottle of pop in your, in your knapsack? Why do they care? Why can't you fly with more than 100 ml? Sorry? Just spit it, say what comes to mind. Sorry? Useful for? Okay, okay, so it's about explosives. Okay, so it's, uh, you could make a liquid-based explosive. And so the idea is that if I can limit the amount of it, liquid that you can bring on, then I don't have to try to see whether it's actually explosive or not. I can just say, well, even if it is, you don't have enough of it to uh, like blow up a plane or something like that. Okay, uh, so that's basically it. 
Is it always 100 ml? You really can't fly with anything more than 100 ml? Okay, so they look for the bottle itself to have some indication, and it, when in doubt, they throw it out, trust me. Okay, forgive a duty-free itself. So that might be in like some sort of sealed package. So they have some providence over that thing. Okay, I once flew with, uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of liters of something that wasn't thrown out. Say it louder. It's like, no, no. Okay. Uh, so if you travel with any sort of like baby formula, breast milk, that kind of thing. Guess what? You're exempt. Okay, so if you have liquid baby formula, you can fly as with as much as, it, as you want. Okay? All right. So if you're going to make a bomb that's a liquid bomb and you're going to try and smuggle it on the plane, how are you going to do it? Okay. Uh, another thing that, that is interestingly exempt is contact lens cleaner. Apparently because they just don't spell small enough bottles. So they usually come in these big, giant bottles. Uh, there was one security researcher, his name's Bruce Schneier. I should link to his article because it's really funny. So he also talks about how he overwrote the password, or sorry, the, the, the boarding pass so that he got pre-screening. Uh, he just like sort of wrote it on top. Uh, and, then, um, and then to show that like this isn't actually enforced for everything, he flew with, uh, so he had this bottle of, of contact lens cleaner. And I forget how big they are, but they're pretty big. They're like 200, maybe 500 milliliters or something like that. And so they're exempt. And then uh, just for fun, he actually flew with two of them. Uh, so he had two bottles. And then uh, the agent's like, why do you have two? Like, isn't one enough? He's like, well, I have two eyes. <laughs> so, like, and then they let him fly with them as well. So, uh, so this is another thing. And there's a couple other things that are exempt. Okay, so you actually can fly with more than 100 ml. So it's this rule that's sort of kind of in effect, but kind of not, uh, kind of thing. Okay. Um, okay. What else uh, can't you fly with? Uh, so these are the main prohibitive. You also have like any kind of drugs, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, money these kinds of things. In this case, actually, TSA doesn't care. Well, they, they sort of care. They don't directly care. So that's not their job. Their job isn't to stop you from flying with drugs. That's more of a border agent issue or a law enforcement issue. So if you're flying within a country, it's a law enforcement issue. If you're taking those across a border, it becomes a border, uh, a border issue. Okay. But if they find it, they're going to refer you. Okay, so they're not going to just be like, we don't care, that's on our job, go, go ahead. Uh, so if they find it, they refer you, but that's not exactly, they're not explicitly looking for it. Okay, there's another thing that you, it's not prohibited, uh, you can fly with it, but you have to do something special with it. Uh, so let's just sort of put this on. Uh, I'll put additional scrutiny. Okay, uh, so different countries are different. Uh, I think, I, I don't know, but anyways, in the US, what do you have to do? So you're standing in, uh, this word came out really wrong, scrutiny. Looks rightish. Um, okay, uh, so let's say you're in the U.S. Uh, you're lined up, uh, so you're taking all this stuff out of your pocket. Uh, so what are you taking out of your pockets? Like, why do you have to empty your pockets? So first off, they don't want to see anything kind of bulky, uh, but mainly you're taking out metal right? Because you're going to go through a metal detector, it's going to set the metal detector off. So they want to know that you're going through the metal detector without any metal on you, essentially. So all metal you have to remove. If you have things that aren't necessarily metal, uh, then they still kind of want you to remove it, but, but it's not like strictly necessary. The main thing is, is to remove metal. 
Uh, what else do you remove? Shoes. Are shoes metal? I mean, they could have a buckle on it. What if your shoe isn't metal? So it's uh, just a normal sneaker <laughs> like mine. Um, then it's okay, right? You can wear your shoes in the U.S.? Uh, no, no. Uh, oh, you have to take it off anyways? Okay, why do they care about shoes? Because there was, uh, there was an incident where was a shoe bomber incident. Then okay, after so... Started. Exactly. So uh, in this case, there was one person one time who once tried to put a bomb in a shoe. Uh, and because that person got caught with the bomb in their shoe, they actually made it onto the airplane. They were trying to light it, apparently, uh, and it wasn't lighting. And then someone's like, why are you trying to light your shoe? And, and so anyways, they, they took the shoe away. Um, and so anyways, because of the shoe bomber, everyone has to take their shoes off. Okay, this is heavily criticized. So the, the term that security people use is they call it uh, security theater. And so the idea is that this is highly reactive. So there's probably no real benefit to taking your shoes off, but it makes everyone feel better, right? Once there was a shoe bomber, therefore we're all going to take our shoes off now and we're going to look at shoes really, really carefully, okay? Uh, what that means is that next time you try and bomb a plane, you're not going to put in your shoe, okay? It doesn't actually solve the root problem. The root problem is trying to get bombs off of planes uh, you're going to put it in your pants or in your shirt or somewhere else, okay? In your belt, I don't know. Um, and so it doesn't really solve, it doesn't address the root problem. So it's sort of feel-good security. And that, that there is some benefit to it. Um, so you want passengers sort of calm and like not freaking out and things like that, right? So if you can sort of calm people down, even if the security measures aren't like really that useful, you might do it. But when they start becoming expensive, right, then that's when you uh, want to change uh, the policy, okay? So not every country requires you to take off your shoes. I don't think Canada does, uh, so you can wear your shoes, uh, but it's more the U.S., uh, what's something else that's sort of unusual? So, uh, so I'm there, you know, I, I kind of, I've emptied my pocket, so they're sitting in the bin, my watch is in my bin. I have my shoes off, they're in the bin, I have my coat in the bin. I slap my laptop, or sorry, my, uh, I just gave the answer away. I slap my knapsack down in the bin. Uh, what do they want? Is it good enough to just put my knapsack down? They want my laptop, right? Why do they, so what, what's the deal with the laptop? Well, first off, what do they want? What do they want from it? What, what do they want me to do with it? Like they want me to, okay, separate it. Okay, so they want the laptop sitting separate. They don't want it in the bag. They don't want it in a case. They want it like sort of open. Okay, uh, so laptop is separated. Okay, lithium batteries. Uh, lithium batteries are actually pretty new. So before there were lithium batteries, you never had to take your laptop out separate. My phone has lithium, lithium batteries, so my iPad does, so I have to separate those. So it's a good guess, not the reason why. It's, uh, laptop wears more than your shoe. So it is small, that's true. Okay, so one time, one person, just like the shoe bomber, tried to put a bomb in a laptop. So it turns out that nowadays it's not so common because everyone has these super slim laptops. But laptops used to have actually a lot of space. Like if you opened it up, there was a lot of like kind of air and like kind of free space in it. They were like kind of clunky and things like that. Um, and so uh, the idea is that uh, you might put a bomb in your laptop. Okay, and then on the x-ray, you might not catch it because there's a lot of other like electronics and stuff in your uh, laptop. So it might be hard to detect. Okay, so that's all true, but why, it doesn't matter if it's in my bag or not, the x-ray is either going to see it or not, right? So why do I have to pull it out? Um, so they're, they're trying to uh, detect uh, an explosive. So there's a very simple reason. Uh, the reason is that they have a very simple test for, to tell whether this is a bomb laptop or a real laptop, okay? The simple test is they're gonna ask you to turn it on, okay? So they'll be like, oh, we think that that's not a real laptop. Will you turn it on for us, please? 
okay? Uh, and that's actually the only reason they want separated. So they don't have to be like, can you dig into your bag and turn it on? They want to just pull it out and they're going to turn it on, okay? How easy would it be to have a laptop that has a bomb? Let's assume that that's easy. I don't know how easy that is, but let's assume that you could actually get a, lap, a bomb into a laptop. How much additional work would it be to have it turned on? Right? It's not like they're going to sit there and like surf the web with it. They're just going to see that like a basic screen comes out. Okay. So in order to drive that, you would need some sort of actual computer, right? What's the smallest like form factor you could get a computer in? Right? So you could get a little Raspberry Pi or something like that, even a phone. If you think about putting this in, so this laptop's like pretty slim, but if you think of like an old school like laptop from maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, you could have this be the computer in the laptop and then all the rest of the free space that you have under the keyboard is for whatever purposes you want, okay? So this probably, once again, not really addressing the root problem. Uh, and the reason that your iPad is okay is just because it's so compact that they basically think that you can't fit a bomb inside of it. Uh, so that's, that's the essence of it, or your Kindle or your phone or whatever the case may be. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So they won't ask everyone by default, but what will happen is it will go through the x-ray. If it looks, I don't know what they're looking for, so they're trained or whatever. Uh, then they'll, so sometimes you'll see that the conveyor belt comes out to the other side and then they, they want to look through your stuff. And so that's usually because they saw something on the x-ray that they want to check out. Uh, you don't always know why it is. Uh, so one time I accidentally flew with a Swiss Army knife, which is actually prohibited. Uh, so that's fine. So then it went through the secondary, they took it, and then they're like, okay, we're going to throw it out. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, uh, it turns out that you can ask for it back. You have to like give your address and things like that. And then they, you have to pay $50 and they'll mail it to you. Or there's some like procedure where you can do it. Uh, another time it was like, um, they, first off, they were pulling a lot of bags. Like it was almost like half of the bags went through. And then um, I think I actually had this knapsack, which you can see is crystal clear. And I had my textbook for comp 352 on data structures and algorithms and so they looked at my bag they're like oh you have a textbook in there i'm like yeah i have a textbook is it like is that a problem they're like oh okay well then you're good to go so like we pulled it across because you had a textbook so i don't know if they just made it up like because they were screening every i have no idea that that struck me as kind of weird but anyway so they, they didn't like it maybe they couldn't see through the textbook because of the x-ray but i think an x-ray could see through a textbook i'm not sure but anyways that, that was kind of the weirdest thing but yeah in this case if they pull it aside and you have a laptop they might ask you to turn it on uh, and so I've seen that happen, like an agent will ask someone to turn it off. But. Pirated content? Uh, probably not. Like it's, once again, it doesn't affect the safety of the plane itself, right? It's not a safety consideration. Uh, it's a law enforcement thing, but it's so fringe that like, it's not like what police are doing their everyday policing on, right? Um, if you're bringing a ton of pirated content in order to sell it, right, then, uh, then border services might be interested in that, right? Because especially if you're not authorized to sell it and things like that. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of questions about like, like when you, on your customs declaration, you'll say like, I'm going to this like conference. Well, are you selling anything at the conference or things like that? So, so they're, they are consumed, they're concerned about non-Canadians coming into Canada, Canadians going into non-Canadian locations and making money because uh, that has to get reported to the Canada Revenue Agency or, or that type of thing. Or there's some sort of taxation considerations. But yeah, but anyways, pirated material, not there, not at the top of their radar. Other questions? Okay, uh, so now you've gone through security, so that's great. Uh, then depending on where you're flying, you might uh, if it's international, let's say you're flying to the U.S. from Canada, you might do customs in Canada uh, before you actually land in the U.S. Okay, uh, so now you're going to talk to a border agency. Okay, so these are different people. Um, right as the Canadian Border Service, but it, it would be the country that you're flying to. Okay, 
they're different than the TSA. Uh, they have a whole different set of considerations. Okay, they're not. Their job isn't to make sure that the no one smuggles a bomb onto the plane. Obviously, if they have some indication, they will re refer you. Okay, so they, it's not that they're going to ignore any red flags that, that that might indicate that you're going to do that. But that's not why they're there. Okay, they're there to make sure that you're authorized to enter the country. You have the right paperwork. Uh, what your employment status is going to be. Are you bringing drugs? Uh, other illicit prohibited items. It could be as small as food, like certain kinds of food. Uh, are you bringing, like if you bring fruit from another country, there might be some like uh, insects or like some uh, sort of bacteria or something that's on that fruit that isn't in that country. And so you might in inadvertently expose the country to it. So they have a whole list of, of sort of weird and wonderful concerns. Um, and so anyways, that's that's their main thing. So. Uh, what they want to do is they first off they, they'll look at your passport. So they're probably the first person in this whole chain to actually want to see your passport. Uh, they'll they'll compare it to you to make sure that you're actually the person that's depicted on the passport. Uh, they'll also look at your boarding pass, uh, any travel documents that are required, visas, that kind of thing. And then they could they could inquire about any additional information. Uh, so especially if they if they think that you're lying about something or not forthright about details, then they have almost unlimited power to to search anything that's on you, right? Uh, if you have a phone and it's password protected, they can compel you to give that password. Uh, it's illegal for you not to give it to uh, them. That was also sort of controversial uh, thing within the law. Uh, but anyways, uh, so they can they can do all sorts of, of different things. They'll go through your phone. They'll call people that are in your phone. Uh, they'll read your emails, that kind of thing. Uh, and so they'll, they'll do everything in their power to, to try and establish whether it's legitimate for you to enter the country or not. Uh, so anyway, so they're concerned about, um, uh, so like money, uh, so usually money laundering, that type of thing. So if you're over $10,000. That's a standard cutoff. Uh, any sort of drugs or prohibited, I'll say illicit items. So in particular, things that might be legal in one country, but they're illegal in another. Um, things that, that uh, like food items, things that might carry uh, bacteria or insects or like that kind of thing. Um, there's all the duty items, so are you bringing alcohol in excess of whatever your limits are? Are you bringing merchandise that's over your, your allowance uh, for what you're allowed to bring, especially if you're coming back into the country? Uh, so there's a bunch of concerns. And these things aren't, it's not illegal for you to bring it back, it's just that you have to pay some money uh, in order to bring it, uh, so that's fine. So they wanna make sure that you're paying for it. Um, yeah, so anyways, these are just a handful of things. Let's put et cetera. All right, so congratulations. You've now made it through customs. You're authorized to fly. Uh, so you spend some time, you know, getting a coffee, getting some food, whatever. You hang out at the uh, at your gate, and now you're ready to go on the plane. Okay, what's the last thing that you do uh, before you get on the plane? Okay, so you're going to show something to someone. Uh, so you're going to board your flight. And so here's you, and you're showing uh, definitely your boarding pass. Generally now, especially, uh, you're going to show some identity. Okay. Uh, typically, this is your passport, but not necessarily. So, for example, if I fly within Canada, I can show my driver's license. Okay. If I fly across an international border, I have to show my passport. Uh, but within Canada, domestic play, I can just get away with a driver's license or something like that. Um, who's the person that's doing this check? So it's the airline, Air Canada, or whoever. Okay, so it's not TSA, it's not the government, it's not border services or anything like that. It's the airline. And they could deny you flight uh, at this particular time if they wanted to. Uh, generally, if you made it this far, there's probably not going to be a compelling reason why they uh, don't allow you. Uh, unless if 
basically one of two things happen. Uh, so the first thing that might happen is, like say you're drunk or something like that, inhibited, uh, then you're a risk to the flight, then they might uh, not let you board and they might refer you to law enforcement. The second thing is that, notice customs is optional. So let's say that you're actually doing a domestic flight, okay? So you go through this whole process and I'm flying from Montreal to Toronto, okay? Who do I show my passport to, right? So I purchase the ticket, so that's already done. So I show up at the airport. I don't necessarily show my passport to anyone, okay? Uh, then I go through, check my bags, that's fine. Then I go through the screening, I'm showing my boarding pass, they're scanning it, I give it to the agent, they're scanning it, but no one's looking at my passport, okay? So amazingly, it's not until I actually get to the gate that someone actually looks and says, does this photo match the person that's standing in front of me, okay? So that's actually a lot of responsibility on an airline agent who's not even a government employee. But let's say that you didn't have your passport. Say you forgot your passport at home and you weren't going through customs because it was a domestic flight. You wouldn't realize it until you're actually at your gate, right? Like you're about to get on your plane and then you're like, oh yeah, where's my, where's my passport, right? Because uh, you don't necessarily show it, especially if you print your boarding pass at home, okay? Similarly, if someone was impersonating someone else, Okay, so you have a friend and they look a lot like you and you want to show their passport and you want to board the flight. Maybe they book the flight in their name, they can't fly. And so they're like, here, you fly for me instead. It's this like airline agent that basically is going to enforce whether you actually are the person that you say you are. Okay, uh, they're the ones that are doing that check. Okay, and so it's sort of crazy that it's not. Um, well, first off, it was if you were crossing a border, border agents would look at it. Okay, but from TSA's perspective, CTA, TSA, they don't care. Okay, so they're not checking. Yeah. Yeah, so and it could even be an identity. So you do have to show something. Okay, now I mentioned that there was a, a escalation of privilege attack on this whole process. Um, so uh, it's very relevant to this. So let me just jump to it. Uh, so this is linked to from the course website. Uh, it was discovered by someone named Chris Segoyan, who's like kind of a famous security researcher. Uh, this is old. Okay, so this will not work today. Um, so it's, it's outdated, uh, but it did work at some time. And uh, when he, he sort of published it, so he wrote up, like how you would do this attack, he published it. And then the FBI came and kicked down his door and they like searched his like apartment and things like that. And then he got really mad about it and turned into this like, uh, like privacy advocate and like chief critic of the TSA and things like that. And so, uh, and then he went on to work for like ACLU and, and different high profile places like that. Uh, so anyway, so that's, that's sort of the backstory. Um, so he developed this attack actually when you could first print your boarding pass from home. So that was sort of the impetus of this. So it was um, uh, back 10, 15 years ago, I forget the exact vintage of this attack. I don't know if I wrote the date down. Um, I, I have about 20 years ago. So. And you could print boarding pass at home. And so what he observed is if you could print the boarding pass at home, then you don't do a passport check anymore. Uh, no one checks your passport. You show up uh, at the boarding pass uh, with your boarding pass. And so there's no passport check at this stage anymore. OK, so uh, there's no passport check. Um, and so this was sort of new. He also pointed out that the boarding pass is unauthenticated. So all the information that's on it is also unauthenticated. And for fun, I think this is actually what got him in trouble with law enforcement. He built a little JavaScript, JavaScript tool. So if you want to make your own boarding pass for United or whichever airline, you could just type in the information you wanted and press a button and then it would create something that looked exactly the same with the barcode and everything, uh, exactly the same as the actual boarding pass that you would legitimately print out. Um, so, yeah. 
And he made it public. Yeah. And so it was just on a website so anyone could go and, and create their own fake boarding passes. Okay. The other thing about 20 years ago is this step for domestic flights uh, of the ID check that happens uh, at the gate. We already said that it's sort of crazy that, that this is the first time they check their passport, but it turned out for the US domestic flights, they didn't even do this check. So they only looked at your boarding pass. So what that meant is, um, or let me see if I get this right. Yeah, yeah, okay, so that's right, yeah, exactly. So at the boarding pass, they, they didn't check your passport, okay? Now, in the US, they do, um, they do have a step that I skipped, uh, which is there is like some pre-screening check where they do check your passport. So it looks like the passport never gets checked anywhere, but there is a sort of step where they uh, do check your passport. So the process was a little different, um, but essentially what happened is uh, nobody, nobody in this whole process would check both your boarding pass and your passport. Okay, so there is no one entity that would check both of those information. Okay, so some people would look at your boarding pass, some would look at your passport, but no one would look at both. Okay, uh, so the, the attack, the escalation of privilege attack was, um, In my understanding, if I remember the details, there was some sort of pre-screening passport check, but they didn't actually look at your boarding pass, okay? And the other problem is you have a bunch of different agencies. So you have the airline, TSA, border services, and they weren't talking to each other. So uh, what you showed to TSA, the airline, you could show something different to the airline and they wouldn't put two and two together and realize that you showed different things to different people, okay? Um, so the basic attack that, that did actually work at one time is, let's say you were on the no-fly list, okay? Um, so adversary is on no-fly. What they would do is they would book ticket <coughs> under a false name, okay? Uh, so they would book a ticket. This false name wasn't on the no-fly list. So they got a ticket in the false name, but their passport didn't match the ticket. So that was the sort of problem, okay? So they would book a ticket under false name. Then what they could do is use this handy JavaScript thing and they create two boarding passes. One of them that matched uh, the ticket, okay? So they would create boarding pass one. with the false name. And then they created boarding pass two with their real name. And actually, I'm, I'm going to soften this. So actually, now that the details are sort of coming back to me, uh, it wasn't the case actually. There were some people that looked at both. I'll, I'll say what the actual details are. So let me revoke uh, this statement. Okay, so the person shows up. First off, when they actually book it, that's when the no-fly check happens. Okay, so the no-fly check, and it's fine because this name isn't on the no-fly list. Okay, uh, then what would happen is only the airline knows what ticket, uh, like who the what the passenger list is for their flight. Okay, uh, so what would happen is if TSA asked for ID. The adversary would show them their real passport and boarding pass two, which matched match their real name. 
Okay. Now, uh, so they're looking at the picture. The person is the picture that's on the passport. It's a real passport. Uh, and there is a boarding pass that goes along with it. There's two problems. One is the person's on the no-fly list. Okay. But they didn't do that check. That's not their job. Right. They're just there to see that, that it's really the real person. Okay. So because they don't talk to the no-fly list, then they're isolated from it so they don't realize it. Okay. So they don't check no fly. The airline already did this when they issued this boarding pass. The person clearly has a boarding pass, so they must not be on the, the no-fly list. Okay. And the second thing is because they're not the airline, they don't actually have a list of passengers. So this person isn't even on the flight. They have a boarding pass for a flight, but there's no passenger on that flight with that name. Okay. But this this the TSA in this case didn't know that. Okay, because uh, the airline maintained the one list and uh, they maintain a different list. Okay, um, so the, the, the other issue with this is that uh, passenger not on flight. Uh, but only airline knows this. Okay, and then when the airline asks for it, either when you show up, usually when at the gate, uh, so the airline's going to ask for identity. In this variant, uh, they didn't have to show their actual identity. They didn't have to show their passport. Okay, they just had to show their boarding pass. Uh, so then the adversary would show boarding pass one, which is for a person who's not on the no-fly list and is actually booked on this flight. Okay, so they are basically able to weave through the system and because different people are checking different things, they weren't talking to each other and there were a bunch of different uh, agents that were involved and they were all kind of siloed in terms of what they were checking. There was a path through it where this thing that shouldn't happen, which is you're on the no-fly list, you shouldn't be allowed to fly, you were actually able to fly. Okay, so this is actually a very classic escalation of privilege. Usually it's computer software where your code isn't authorized to be a root access you know, and you're, and you're doing some sort of software attack, but this is kind of like the real life version of what you might call an escalation of privilege, okay? So you're basically using a policy, okay? Now, since then, this is fixed, okay? We don't know all the ways that are fixed. Maybe the TSA has some of this information now uh, because we have, this was 20 years ago, so now we have better computer systems and databases and things like that. Uh, so they probably have more information here. Um, so there's, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I'll say probably, more information sharing. And then the main response was that airlines would check ID as well. So the airlines check ID. So they don't let you just board with a boarding pass. You have to show your identity as well. They're going to try and match it to you as a person, uh, that kind of thing. OK. Um, but anyways. Uh, so the main lesson here is that procedures are actually really hard to get right. Uh, they're complicated. They have a lot of moving parts. Uh, it just takes one sort of path through a procedure, and then you can defeat the entire purpose of the procedure, even though you have all these like crazy uh, security mechanisms and things like that. Questions about this? Okay, so uh, next class what we'll do is we'll look at uh, the same origin policy. So this is... It's also a policy, but it's a technical one, not a human-based one. And yeah, so I'll see you next class.